Hiya, BookTube. Well, welcome back to this third Middle March Meditations. I can't believe that I'm doing as well as I am, actually, at working unscripted. Look, thanks very much also. I seem to have acquired a lot of new subscriptions since I started doing this particular set of videos. So if I'm just gaining a lot of Middle March fans, I'm cool with that. Thank you so much. You know, I'm such a newbie. You know, I'm so grateful for anything you give me. So that was that's really kind um, to the, the six people that have added themselves to my subscription list. Thank you so much. So we are going to continue with what well, we were on page nine. And we were talking about how Dorothea, it was going to be tricky to get her married off, even though she had all the advantages that you could imagine a 19th century girl would want. She's got wealth. She's got the family name. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember what the third thing was. Isn't that terrible, isn't it? She's got wealth. She's got the family name. What else has she got going for her? Uh, just that she was rather, uh, you know, beautiful. Yes, she was beautiful. How could I forget that? Hmm. I bet George Eliot didn't. George Eliot took a lot of, well, I'm not sure how those comments were made to her. In the 19th century, there was no social media, so I presume she overheard them or saw them, read them somewhere. I know Henry James referred to Eliot as that horse-faced blue stocking, and I've been told he meant it affectionately. Uh, it, hmm. I'll leave you to decide that, right? I don't need to make a judgment on that. But it was generally agreed that you know, she wasn't um, naturally beautiful. And maybe that's why she always um, gives her characters such beauty to show that it, you know, it doesn't gain you as much as, as people might think it does. So anyway, going on. So we were, we were talking about why could Dorothea not get married, that, that a man might be wary to marry her because she had these very strong religious opinions and they made her tend to act in a rather extreme manner. Page 9 talks about how if she saw a sick laborer, she would kneel down suddenly on the brick floor and and pray as if she was living in the time of the apostles. That's what that's what Elliot, how the narrator describes it. And, and it ends the paragraph by saying, well, such a wife might awaken you one fine morning with a new scheme for the application of her income which would interfere with political economy and the keeping of saddle horses. So the, 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 the general consensus is lovely girl, everything going for, but just a little bit too extreme in her opinions. And I, I underlined one phrase on, on page nine. This is page 10 you're looking at right now. We're, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. But on page nine, this beautiful passage, which I have to read out loud. This should I should frame this or something and put it somewhere because I, I think we still do this a lot. OK, you judge, you judge. OK, so women were expected to have weak opinions, but the great safeguard of society and of domestic life was that opinions were not acted on. Sane people did what their neighbors did. And so that if any lunatics were at large, one might know them and avoid them. I, I think I'm sure we're still doing that. <laughs> it's, it's terrible to read something that, you know, is dated from the 1860s and to think it's kind of a shame that's still mainly true. But there you go. Human nature human nature. It, it shows that these books still have relevance, and that's why. Because if Elliot can make a comment like that, and, and in 2023, I can still go, mm-hmm, <laughs> and, and you out there can still go, mm-hmm, then, then she said something that probably has uh, resonance, and probably will continue to have resonance in some way throughout time. I don't know if that's one of the qualities of a classic book, but it, in my opinion, it, it does. If, if an author has the insight to go right deep down into human nature and pull out a principle, something that we'll probably always see happening no matter how long humans are around, then I think that's a mark of, of really insightful literature. And, and not all authors do it as well, but you know, Eliot is good at it, very good at it. So, page 10. Well, page 10 is interesting because, of course, um, you know, it talks about how men were attracted to Dorothea anyway. You know, it said that, that although they were prejudiced by this alarming hearsay that is her tendency to have rather strong opinions um it says they found that she had a charm unaccountably 
reconcilable with it. And then it goes on to say, this I think is interesting, because watch the words that start to be chosen here. We're already on the bottom of page nine. We've got the word charm, that she had a charm. The next sentence says, most men thought her bewitching. Start to circle those words, charm, bewitching. If I go on to page 10, which you can now see here at the top, it talks about that she was bewitching when she was on horseback. She loved the fresh air, etc. Her eyes and cheeks growed. And then it, it's the last sentence in the paragraph. Riding was an indulgence which she allowed herself in spite of conscientious qualms. In other words, her very stringent religious principles were kind of warning her that this wasn't always a good thing. She felt that she enjoyed it, that is horse riding, in a pagan, sensuous way. Oh, I, I circled those words immediately. I thought, oh my goodness. Okay. And always looked forward to renouncing it. <laughs> Meaning, she didn't really have any plans to renounce it just, just right away. And this was interesting. And so you can see me marking up the top of the page there about hippomorphism. And I've noted, this is a, a lovely, if you can look up that article, Wendy Doniger, uh, Diary, Crazy About Horses, from the London Review of Books, 23rd September 1993. I believe I found it either on academic, Academia EDU or JSTOR, but it might just be available online. What it what it does is it, it traces throughout literature this um, the sexual symbolism of young women and horses and riding horses. Uh, so uh, it's it, it's not a new symbolism, by the way. I mean, Elliot is just picking up something that that she has noticed happening in uh, literature before. I immediately spotted another author did you if you watched my review of uh, margarita liberaki's three summers the middle girl of the three sisters infanta is just like dorothea brooke very strict in her religious principles keeping herself away from young men but she's absolutely obsessively in love with her horse and rides and goes riding all the time and it you know, it just, there is something about the riding of a horse which is meant to picture, I think, a young woman's sexuality, their desire to have a partner, but their desire, I think, too, to dominate. I, I, I believe it's in India. Oh, I hope I get this right. It'd be terrible if I misremember this, but it is in that article by Wendy Doniger that in India, the word for sexual intercourse where the woman is on top is basically the equivalent of wrong. <laughs> that is to say it shouldn't happen. Like a woman should not be dominating. She should not be mounting. She should be mounted. She should be the animal, not the rider, which uh, I know if, if you're starting to go, mm, you know, fair to you, you know, you're, you're allowed to think that in these meditations. I'm saying, you know, how the symbol has been used in, in times past. So what the paragraph says to me is, okay, Dorothy is, she's been described up until now, the narrator has been telling us what Dorothea is like. Now, we're still being told, but the telling is starting to reveal things that, that I would say are a little bit different than what we have been told. So we've been given this picture of this very consistently religiously principled girl. And now what we're starting to see slowly, the narrator is starting to create cracks in that really perfect religious facade and I, she's going to continue to do this for the rest of this chapter so uh, i've gone on you can see i've also circled the word ardent because i kept thinking of the forest of arden again if you know shakespeare and as you like it the forest of arden was where a lot of interesting um sexual shenanigans went on i can't remember if midsummer night's dream is also set if the forest there isn't also arden it it may not be it may just be a forest. But forests were places where interesting things went on. Forests, if you remember my review of Christopher Hill's um, The World Turned Upside Down, I was talking about how the forests were places that couldn't easily be policed. So people who either couldn't get on and belong in society or society wanted them gone or they had to get gone before society did something else, they went to the forest. They went to the forest and they lived in the forest. So forests were sort of lawless places. And so the word ardent comes from Arden. And so the idea then that there was a, there is something about Dorothea that is a little ungovernable, more than a little ungovernable, that, that I think that what religion is masking is her true personality. So, of course, this paragraph, I'm going to skim read it because it basically says that, you know, whenever anyone came to visit, a man came to visit uh, their uncle's home, 
Dorothea would assume that if the man wasn't coming to see her uncle, that the man was interested in Celia, her younger sister, not in Dorothea. That, that she had very strange ideas of what she thought an ideal husband would be. Uh, particularly, she, she mentions John Milton. She would have liked to have been John Milton's wife when he was blind, just so that she could help him. But then I thought, okay, she's got a very interesting, interesting idea because, the, uh, you know, you wonder, again, there almost seems to be a, a denial of her own sexuality while that sexuality is trying to express itself uh, by other means. So we're going down to the bottom of the page, uh, again, talking about all these peculiarities and how, uh, you know, the neighborhood was trying to drop hints to Dorothea's uncle that he really ought to get an older middle-aged woman. This was this was very often done with orphaned uh, girls. If you remember, if you read uh, Austin's Persuasion, there you have a case where a motherless um, girl, instead of letting her just grow up on her own, just being guided by her father, an older middle-aged woman is is sort of paid, you know, in some cases to just be their sort of surrogate mother and give them the kind of guidance that only an older woman could give a younger woman since there were so many things to know and get right. I mean, there still are, but I don't know if it helps. Now things change too quickly. I just don't think a mother can, you know, adequately advise daughters in, in every case. Or, you know, I can't speak as a mother, though. If you're a mother and you think, yep, yeah, you can do it. It's no problem. That's cool. Comment because, you know, we all learn from each other. So anyway, this, this long and short of it, Dorothy's uncle was not going to get this middle-aged woman. Sorry, I have not moved up the page for you. That's very, very rude. Let's do that. As soon as I can grab hold of that darn thing. Da, 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 da. Where is it here? There we go. So there, it's down there at the bottom of the page. There's my thumb. That's not a particularly helpful thing to see. So, um, that paragraph ends by saying, so Miss Brooke presided in her uncle's household, wow, at, under the age of 20, and did not at all dislike the new authority with the homage that belonged to it. So that's interesting too. Again, we're seeing an interesting side of Dorothea. This highly principled religious girl has sitting underneath that a lot of passions and a lot of desire that I think the, the, the religion is kind of just keeping a lid on but I, it concerns me because I think that you can only, religion can only mask a person's real personality so long. That's my thought. You know, please feel free to disagree. But I'm thinking of my own past. I'm thinking of um, the years that I was an evangelical Christian. Your real personality, all the things you try to suppress in order to fit in with a particular faith and its demands, you can only do that for so long. And then the cracks start to show. I, I just think it's inevitable, but it might take a few years. I mean, you know, you'll be fine for ages. I mean, I was fine for ages, but it, it the eventually, if if what the religion's asking of you is is meaning you have to be untrue to yourself in some fundamental way, that it leaks out. It just it it can't really help it. They can't really help it. Anyway, that is the end of that page. Let's take this image off, and I'm going to have to try to put another image on. Give me just two moments. May I just switch off and switch back on again? Be right back. Okay, there we go. That's better. Right, so here we are now on page 11. Um, I went and looked up the names of two men who at the top of this page are being named as possible suitors to Dorothea. Uh, there was, where is this gentleman? Oh, ice cream truck. Does anyone want an ice cream? Can you hear that? Oh, no, he's gone. Never mind. Bear with me. So, yeah, there was a gentleman named James. I'm not going to find him now. Who came came to visit J Sir James Chetham. Sir James Chetham on page 10. And on page 11, there was also the Reverend Edward Casabon. Casabon, there's a name. That's a lovely name. I'm sure she chose it. And why is it always an Edward I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go back through 19th century literature and see what is it about the name Edward, and maybe even 20th and 21st. I'm, I'm remembering, you know, having a bit of fun reading the Twilight series, but that's a completely different kind of book, okay? So not comparing those two, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to get horrible comments like, you're comparing Twilight to Middlemarch? No, 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 okay? No, not doing that, okay? Different thing. Different thing altogether. But at any rate, so we've got these two suitors, 
uh, one of whom is also has very strong opinions. Um, Edward Casabon apparently has views of his own. That'll be interesting. So that that sounds um, dangerously non-conforming or Puritan as well, which you know could could get Dorothea a bit worked up because she's she's into unconventional opinions, isn't she? She has that Puritan spirit what we talked about from her DNA. Now, what I'm going to come to this, where I've got Mama's Jewels, of course, that was the title of this meditation, because this scene is, I, I just, the, the number of thoughts that occurred to me, I actually can't get them all down, probably will forget to express all of them in this video. I could see myself coming back and going, oh, can I just talk about the jewels? But let's see how we go. Let's see how we go. So we know that um, Celia and Dorothea's parents died when when i well they say when they were 12 years old they were <laughs> they couldn't both be 12 years old at that time so uh we'll assume that dorothea was 12 and is now 20 or thereabouts so we're talking about seven to eight years ago and six months ago probably because dorothea reached the age of 20 her uncle gave her custody of their mother's jewelry box and it was dorothea's you know, it'd be a natural thing for her to sit with her sister, go through the items and, and try to divide them up, be, you know, fairly between the two of them. Now, six months has gone by since she was given this box of jewels and she's done absolutely nothing. She's locked them away and done absolutely nothing. And poor Celia, her younger sister, aware of <laughs> and waiting for Dorothea as the oldest uh, it, it, these traditions must have been so hard on youngest children. That there are so many things that youngest children simply got no say in, it seems. So poor Celia has waited and waited and waited. And she's she's rehearsed a speech that she'll make to try to persuade Dorothea to do what really she ought to be doing, which is pulling that box out and going through the items. And I... I won't go through the speech as such. You can read it at the bottom of page 11, except I, I put um, inverted commas, inverted, pardon me, inverted commas, inverted quotation marks. Here you can see them in their dialogue where um, Celia, where does she say it? Where I've, I've gone, yeah, there we go. Yeah, first it's Dorothy who says it first because Celia's sort of saying, you know, I believe you have never thought of them. That is the jewels since you locked them up in the cabinet here. And Dorothea says, well, dear, now I put the dear in quotation marks because it just sounded a bit like trying to be nice when you don't really mean it. Well, dear, <laughs> we should never wear them, you know. So Dorothea says, we wouldn't be wearing those jewels. And Celia has her little speech prepared. Um, Celia colored and looked very grave. And then she says in response, I think, dear. <laughs> now, two can play this game. Uh, we are wanting in respect to Mama's memory, to put them by and take no notice of them. In other words, you know, it's not very respectful to Mother. If, she's, if these are her jewels, they would naturally be handed down to her daughters. And, and what, are we, what are we saying about our feelings for our mother if we won't deal with this, if we just hide it? Um, and then she, of course, ha but she has to add an argument, and I think this is lovely. Um, she, she has to say, necklaces are quite usual now. And then she has to name someone that Dorothea admires, a Madame Poinçon who was stricter in some things than Dorothea was. And I'm going on to page 12 now without changing the screen, but we'll get there. Um, and, and this madame now wears ornaments. And, and she says, and Christians generally. She said, surely there are women in heaven now who wore jewels. Well, that's a hard argument to counter because there must have been. And, uh, and, and Celia was conscious, she said, of some mental strength when she really applied herself to argument. Now, she'd done really well because she's presented some very sound reasons without losing her temper. And, and Dorothea goes ahead and, and, and seems to agree, all right, we'll, we'll have, if, you liked, if you'd like to wear them, we'll go get them, and bustles to get them out, and, and they lay them all out, and in the middle of page five, I should change the page, let's change the page here. This might take a little bit of time, but um, bear with me, because I got it down, let's just grab, and it might come down also in a funny sort of funny sort of way what do i mean by that it might come down and need turning around that's that's probably it yeah there we go you could see it now that's no good we can't have that so we are going to just transform it and i believe i need to turn it no i always do this wrong this is again my left and right thing um tormenting me there we go 
<laughs> that I can't even do a, a page right. So, so they get the, the jewels out, and it, it says here, the casket was soon opened before them, and the various jewels spread out, making a bright parterre, parterre being uh, one of those lovely formal gardens that you see them in England as well as in France, where the hedges are all trimmed and planted so that they create a pattern if you look at them from above. You know, those were very popular in the late 18th and early 19th century. So they're, 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 you could have to picture the jewellery probably as being all laid out in a pretty sort of arrangement somehow. I don't know how they would have done it. And uh, it, it's interesting that Dorothea is the first person to identify a piece that would look really good on her sister. And she does so by saying, Dorothea immediately took up the necklace and fastened it round her sister's neck, where it fitted as closely as a bracelet, but the circle suited the Henrietta Maria style of Celia's head and neck. Now, Henrietta Maria was the wife to Charles I. And now we've got another civil war illusion. You know, Henrietta Maria was hated by the Puritans because she was a Catholic and they always feared that, at feared that she was uh, giving Charles sympathies with Catholicism. Hmm? Didn't do that word very well. And wanting wanting to influence him back to I'm almost take, turning the clock back before Henry VIII and, and returning England to being a, a Catholic country. And obviously they were greatly opposed to that. Politically, England had reached a point where I don't think it would have been simple to move them back and make them a Catholic country. There were too many people with different religious sympathies. But So to, to compare Celia with Henrietta Maria, when we already know that Dorothea has this this Puritan strain that's coming through from her past is interesting. It, my guess at this point in the book is that it's setting them up for some kind of rivalry, that although they get along reasonably well now, as best you can manage with sisters, you already can sense a tension that Celia has had to bring this up after six months. Is It says something about their relationship and Dorothea's respect for her sister. Uh, but there's a tension, and that tension was just going to grow. And the fact that Celia's neck and, and shoulders are being compared to Queen Henrietta Maria. I just think it's okay. This is this is beginning to create this Cromwellian um, dichotomy. Celia now is almost representing the royalist side, while Dorothea represents the Puritan or, or Roundhead side. And you can just see that is the conflict going to escalate to the kind of proportions that England Civil War did? Is it going to get ugly? But right now we're still in fairly tame territory. So Henry, uh, Henrietta Maria Celia is now wearing this lovely amethyst necklace, which uh, Dorothy encourages her to wear and starts telling her that she should also wear some of the other pieces with different dresses. And uh, and, and, and Celia is, is trying to persuade Dorothea that she should have a piece, particularly there's a piece with a, a pearl cross. And uh, But Dorothy is absolutely adamant, no, 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 you cannot wear the cross as an ornament. That's, that's not what it's meant to be. Um, and Dorothy is almost shutting down the the whole conversation by sort of, you know, insisting that um, Celia have all the jewellery. And obviously, um, I, sh I now now I'm still a page behind, but gone through that page again very quickly. <laughs> right. So I think it's I'm doing from the from the third paragraph here where it says Celia felt a little hurt, totally justified. There was this strong assumption of superiority. And yeah, that's coming from Dorothea. Dorothy is basically saying, you know, jewelry is just beneath me. I'm I'm above all that. Celia, you have it. Meaning, Celia, you're below me. This, you know, this is your sort of thing. You know, you crass, worldly creature. <laughs> you know, you have all the jewels. That's that's the level you're at, you know, spiritually speaking. And I can understand why that hurt. That 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 even though I don't think Dorothea meant it, I just don't think she's conscious of what she's doing to her sister. So, of course, Celia protests and said, well, I can't wear them if you, the older sister, won't wear them. And, and the argument goes on. And, and what's interesting is that um, she starts looking for something for Dorothea, something that would sit better on her, at least one thing. And she happens across a ring box. And when she opens it up, it's this fine emerald with diamonds. And Dorothea undergoes a very bizarre personality, well, blip, I don't know what to call it, but you can see here I've started underlining how very beautiful these gems are. 
Dorothea, said Dorothea, under a new current of feeling, as sudden as the gleam, that is the gleam of the emerald ring. It is strange how deeply colors seem to penetrate one like scent. I suppose that is the reason why gems are used as spiritual emblems in the revelation of St. John. They look like fragments of heaven. I think that emerald is more beautiful than any of them. Now, this is very odd. Uh, she mentions revelation, and it's true. There are seven gemstones mentioned, I uh, believe it's in the 21st chapter of revelation, which are the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. An emerald is one of those stones. However, amethyst, the stones that were in the necklace that Dorothea first gives to Celia, they're also one of the seven stones. But you don't see Dorothea being particularly moved by amethyst. Amethysts don't do anything to her. There's also pearls. She's seen pearls and she's seen gold and they don't seem to have any effect on her. But suddenly these emeralds, well, I, you know, What's a girl to do? I immediately thought, okay, there's something. Elliot's not doing this for nothing. What is it about emeralds? Well, there was a couple of things that I found interesting. I have a really weird book. Now, because I've trapped myself in this table, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pause recording because I'm going to go get this book for you so you can see the cover. Hang on two ticks. Okay, so I'm going to put this right over my face. I mean, that that's no loss, is it? Here we go. So you can see it. So it is. Jewelry in the Age of Queen Victoria. This is a British Museum publication. You can see it's one hell of a big, heavy book. That's probably why I forgot to bring it with me. Um, so <laughs> this was given to me, by the way. If I have a friend who might watch this video because I told her that this book turned out to be very useful. When she gave it to me, she was moving house. And you, you can see the size and weight of that book. You can see why maybe, maybe she thought, I wonder if I can give that book a home because, you know, whoops, sorry, that's me knocking the table. Because it's so heavy, it's, you know, the things that you have to pack when you move house. You always try to reduce the size and weight of them. So she gave the book to me and uh, and I loved it. I paged through it and thought, oh, God, the photographs are beautiful, which they are. I didn't really know what else I was going to do with it apart from, you know, look at it occasionally. But as it happens, it has a whole page that it devotes to this very scene. You know, what is it about these emeralds? Because the all the jewels that Celia and Dorothea look at, they are all precious or semi-precious stones, and they're beautiful. But it's the emeralds that, that somehow they do something to Dorothea. In fact, there there's almost a magical element to it. You could almost accuse Elliot right here of leaving realistic writing and getting just a little bit fanciful, because there's something, there's something Lord of the Rings about this emerald ring <laughs> and there's something lord of the rings about the the power of the, the bracelet there's a bracelet that goes with the the ring but both things circle round you know so she puts on this emerald bracelet and this emerald ring and she's captivated she says you can see it here at the bottom do i even have it yes they are lovely said dorothea slipping the ring and bracelet on her finely turned finger and wrist and holding them towards the window on a level with her eyes all the while, her thought was trying to justify her delight in the colors by merging them in her mystic religious joy. I don't know what's going on here, but I suspect it could be something much different than, than maybe just her religion. And I'm suggesting that because what the British Library book suggests is, is that um, emeralds were symbols of fertility. They were symbols of rebirth. They were also symbols of renewing or restoring sight. And perhaps what these emeralds are doing, I, I talked about there being cracks in in the religious facade of Dorothea. I feel as though the emeralds, perhaps with, with the power that gemstones are always felt to have had, are beginning to open her eyes. And that's why she's holding them up. She can't stop herself from looking at them. And that's what the British Library book, I think, made that point. And I think, it, although this is a bit magical, because I don't think emeralds can actually do that, but I think what Elliot's trying to do is use this as um, almost, we're, we're almost into symbolism now and metaphor. This moment with the emeralds is the moment that Dorothea perhaps begins, excuse me, I'm gonna move this camera a little bit, uh, begins to see herself differently or the world. Something is, something has cracked in a big way, whereas maybe the other little fault lines, 
you know, like her loving to ride horses so much, you know, which is a little bit of a fault line. That probably might have given way at some point. But this fault line, you, you almost think, uh oh, you know, this is going to be the one. This is this is going to be this crack on the on the windshield, the windscreen. I'll use both terms because I know we've got U.S. And, and U.K. people watching that. You know how you can get a crack and it can just keep growing and growing. And, you, you know, eventually you're going to have to replace that windscreen because it's just one of those cracks. This is, I think, one of those cracks. It's going to be dangerous. You've got to get it fixed. But she doesn't really know what's happening. It's clear that she's wondering what the heck is going on. Uh, of course, she, she makes Celia a little irritated because up until this point, she was going to renounce all the jewelry. And now she's only gone and picked the two pieces that Celia finds really attractive as well. So again, we've got that hint that, that some kind of conflict may open up that might separate these two sisters. Whereas now they're they're so close, they're actually sitting in a little parlor that they share that sits between their two bedrooms. So they're very, very close. They live very close together. If they should fall out in a in a big way, if if they should have a disagreement that's very strong, it's going to be very hard for them to occupy the same house. So Dorothea goes on on page fourteen, and I haven't marked very much else on on page fourteen, so I'm, I won't note it. I'll, I'll leave it. Uh, but she says, "Yes, I will keep these, the ring and the bracelet." Said Dorothea. Then, letting her hand fall on the table, she said in another tone, Yet what miserable men find such things and, and work at them and sell them. And of course, she just puts Celia in, in doubt again, thinking you want them, but now you don't want, what do you, what do you want? But Dorothea does hang on to them, no matter what. She keeps looking at them. She doesn't take them off. She keeps wearing them. Celia puts all the other jewelry away, which is hers. She doesn't try to wear any of it. Uh, and, and she goes away. And then there's another little snippy exchange between the two sisters where, where Celia says, are you going to wear, you know, the emerald things? Are you going to wear them in company? Meaning, are you just going to wear them here privately? Or, or, or are you going to, I need to know if you're going to wear yours in company, because that's how I'm going to decide whether I can wear mine in company. And, and Dorothea, something, again, something unhinges in her. It's a tiny little thing. But it says, she glanced quickly at her sister. Across all her imagina imaginative, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this sentence so badly. Across all her imaginative adornment of those whom she loved, and she loved Celia and would, would attribute good qualities to Celia, there darted now and then a keen discernment. In other words, I think what Dorothea is realizing is deep, deep down, in spite of all this habit of saying lovely things about Celia, there's something between her and Celia that, they will not, something is going to get between them. And and it does now. It does now. Because what Dorothea says to her very haughtily is, I cannot tell to what level I may sink. And that's still, that's almost another jab at Celia. Like, oh, and you want to wear these in company, you sad, unspiritual creature. I mean, it's, it's not spelling it out like that, but it, the message is clear to Celia. It's like, oh, I need to I need to sink to the level of wearing these in public, do I? It's not enough that you got the jewels. I thought, you know, we were already descending into slightly less than my usual standard, but now we're going down another, you know. Oh, yes, let's see. Shall I sink to that level too? And and both of these things, are they're just jabs at Celia. They're just saying, you know, you're not as worthy as I am. You know, your spirituality doesn't mean as much. And I thought Celia, I think, is understandably hurt. Um, she says, um, I trust that the wearing of a necklace will not interfere with my prayers. Ooh, ow. There, you see, shot back. And, and that's fair. That's a fair shot. That's saying, yeah, do you know what? I can manage loving God without, you know, and wearing a necklace. It'll be okay. So that was, that was mean. But that was the first, that's, that's the closest thing right now that you're getting to an argument between the two sisters. But I can't imagine they make up at the end of the chapter, you know, Dorothea kind of does a little, a little, little gesture, a little affectionate gesture, which kind of, which says to Celia, "Yeah, I messed up just back there, didn't I?" And Celia forgives her. But I think, mm, what are we seeing here? Are we seeing the beginning of much more of this kind of tension and difficulty between them? Will it get uglier? We shall see. That, my dears, is today's meditation. Thanks for joining me. I'm going to put this up as soon as I can, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye.